All right, let's get started. Welcome to Rob the 11th, lecture eight. Today we're gonna to continue, we're gonna continue discussing additive manufacturing or really review what we talked about last time. We're gonna discuss best practices, which we didn't quite get to. We'll go over laser tires. We'll do a quiz and we have a couple of like cool demonstrations. So we may not get all the way through this lecture and I would like to do this quiz. This is a quiz from last lecture. So it's over uh, additive manufacturing. Homework two I'll post today, this afternoon. I'll probably give you guys something like two weeks to do it. Um, now it'll be more, it'll be a combination of kind of paper and pencil style problems like question five from homework one and also some hands-on stuff. So things we'll want you to do with the tools that you're learning, not as extensive as like build anything, but use some of the tools we're learning in class. Um, one of the things we're gonna do is have you guys slice an STL file. So I'm gonna give you an STL file and have you return the G code for it. That means that you'll be able to print it. So there's two things that we were thinking about giving you STL files to slice. One is the full ball about assembly that we made. So what that would let you do, we would modify it so that it could be 3D printed, but that would let you make, for example, a keychain or something with the, like the Formlabs SLA printers we have. So we'll just have you do G code, but then you have, you know, you're one step away from having a little printed version of it. So the two options are, at least the two options that came to my mind most readily, were the ball, finished ball bot step file that you guys have. So imagine a small version of that, or a robotic leg that we've developed. So like one of the ones that you, you've seen a couple times uh, and as we talk about research, which, or anything else, like any thoughts? Who likes the ball bot keychain idea? All right, that's pretty solid. Who likes robotic leg or something else? All right, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do keychain ball bot keychain. I think that seems like a good thing. And I'm interested to see, yeah. Is it possible to give us both STL files? And then we yes, <laughs> definitely possible. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe what we'll do is we'll give both and you'll have to turn G code for one of them. Awesome, okay, so we'll do that. That's cool, I think that'll be fun. <coughs> So let's get back to kind of where we were in lecture. We were, we had gone over this like specking process of choosing the components of motor and transmission ratio that kind of set up the physical model of your, of your robot. Now we're talking about the actual physical design, how to make it. And we've begun talking about kind of some layout, but mostly manufacturing. And we'll do some, uh, another lecture on sort of general design after the manufacturing bit. So the types of manufacturing we're learning are rapid prototyping manufacturing. So prototyping that lets you create parts and designs quickly. We're learning some subtractive and mostly additive, the 3D printing part. We talked about breaking kind of manufacturing up into these three categories, formative being kind of molding. We don't do any of that or even really talk about it in this class, although you can do some cool stuff with 3D printed molds and, and for example, uh, silicone. We will talk about some subtractive, that's kind of typical CNC machining, um, what we're doing with laser cutting, and we'll talk about water jetting, but you guys won't have to do it. That's all subtractive and then additive, being the different versions of 3D printing. I wanted to highlight, oops, highlight some of the subtractive manufacturing methods just so you know what they are and you'll kind of hear about them, mostly to make you comfortable with them. One is milling, this is the most common type of CNC machining is how we get mostly, almost all of our parts made. Um, mill is kind of going through CNC, so computer numerically controlled, removing material. Uh, we talked about a three axis mill and a five axis mill. What are the differences between those? Slash what parts, what are the differences in parts that those systems make? Yeah. Over, because the end mill would hit it. So for example, like the teacup, yeah. they don't drill into the top. The yes, that's an undercut. So no undercuts on a, on a three axis mill. So if we had a five axis mill, we could then move that mill bit around and kind of come at it from this face. Is there such a thing as a six? This is a real interview question that I got at uh, Apple product design. So if working on the iPhone, this is a real interview, technical interview question. Why are there no six axis mills? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the sixth degree of freedom is the rotation of the mill bit, which it doesn't matter. So there's no there's no concept of the six axis mill because the, that degree of freedom is rotating and it's arbitrary. Nice, good job. You would have passed that interview. Um, okay, so 
So you can make decisions based on your design that will change it from three axis mill to a five axis mill. What was the major downside of a five axis mill? Expensive. Expensive. Quite awesome. Okay, and this is all traditional manufacturing methods. When we have parts made, our process for this using traditional methods is to, is to send everything to China. It's machined in China and it's sent back to us. So we don't do any of the manufacturing of our parts here because we're not really prototyping. We're certainly not rapid prototyping. We're building more polished, more closer to finished products, which we use CNC manufacturing methods for. So know that this is like this is an option for you. You guys can always have parts machined. So now that you're kind of learning how to build parts, if you didn't want to use rapid prototyping tools, you wanted to use lathes and mills, you can have that done. You don't have to do that yourself. Cool. Okay. Lathing or turning, which is the other option. So now we're rotating a part and uh, cutting at a radius. The machines look like this. They cut like that. Um, they have a cool use in kind of woodworking, which is neat. You can see some pretty cool designs developed from, uh, from a lathe and woodworking. And we talked a little bit, a tiny bit about tolerances, and we'll come back to this again later in the, in the best practices. What, what is a tolerance, what does this do? What do tolerances provide? Who are they for? Who are tolerances for? So we want to provide a tolerance. This is an ISO standard for, for dimensioning. This would be tolerances for things like this, but also things like three printers. Yeah, who's, who's it for? Tolerances are for us when we're doing the design work, so we know how much it can, how much when you go out to building like a bearing, for example, the whole yeah. design bigger. Yeah, so I would say the tolerances are for the person making the part, which might be you. In fact, it's probably you these days, but it would not be you probably in the future. It's probably a machinist making it. So the tolerances are for the machinist to know when they're cutting a part, is it in spec? And so you can, the, the tighter you make your tolerances, the more expensive it will be. So another factor, these are kind of examples of how tight tolerances can get. Fine, medium, coarse. We have a process for tolerancing, which uses this book, Machinery's Handbook, but this is not something we're gonna talk about. At this point, what I wanted you to know is tolerancing is a thing that, that is needed when making machines, specifically for parts that mate with each other, like bearings and shafts. And this, for general machine design, this is all true. We're going to talk a little bit more about tolerances when we talk about best practices, specifically for rapid prototyping. Any questions about that? Anybody know how you would know what tolerance to choose? Yeah, so one, there's two pieces of information. One would be like you're usually mating a part that you buy, like a bearing or a shaft that's, that's a commercial part, so it would have its own tolerances. And you would basically select a tolerance that you want, and that would guide the tolerance for the part that you're making. So that all the parts that you buy, the part that you make, and the tolerance you want all fit together and are correct. But this is something we're not really, just something you should can know, but not something you're kind of required to know for this class. Okay, then we got into additive manufacturing or 3D printing. We talk about this flow where you start with a part in SolidWorks, we have to slice it. So it exports the, C, the STL from SolidWorks, we're gonna slice it and turn it into G code, and those are the instructions provided to a 3D printer. We talked about how the STL is really a digitized version of a shape. It creates a bunch of polygons, and the size of those polygons go into the size of the STL file, how big it is, but also how true it will be to the kind of non-digitized shape. This is an example of like a sphere with many STL elements and fewer STL elements. You can just get a feel for how the, the shape is changing as it's being digitized. Slicing operations will likely be performed by Melissa, by Alyssa or the makerspace. That's actually potentially not true. I'll talk about that more in a sec. This is the creation of G-code. You guys, I think, know what G-code is. But it's the instructions provided for the 3D printer. It has a really specific format. So it looks something like this, but it's exactly what the 3D printer is going to do, kind of step by step. And it's a standardized way of providing instructions across 3D printers. This is one of the things that made proliferation of 3D printers explode. When you're doing the slicing, you may have some options about making the part. Those options could include infill patterns, so different types of patterns or their percentage. Um, why? What's the deal with infill? Why is infill a thing in FDM? 
but not a thing for other types of 3D printing. Yeah, do you know? Um, you can like choose how much like support you want and on the inside, how like heavy you want to make it, how strong you want to make it. How heavy and how strong, and then what, that's true. Oh, that's right, well then there's another factor that might drive those decisions. Not just how heavy and how strong it is, but how long it takes. So a lot of this is about, a, a big limitation of FDM printers is they take a long time. So a lot of work has been done to try and speed them up. So what they do is they'll go slower and more meticulously around the edges and faster during the infills. And the infill will change the strength, change the weight, but it can also change the speed. In addition, you can change the layer height, which changes the speed. It changes how thick the layers will be, um, which changes a lot about the part. You're going to have to use Cura. Cura is an open source slicing software developed by Ultimaker. It's going to come up. OK, now we got into like actual additive manufacturing processes. We started with FDM. Well, this is the most common type of 3D printer, and it works kind of exactly like you would think it would work. You're squeezing a tube to a toothpaste, and they're drawing apart with it. So it really heats up a plastic through a nozzle and then it injects that into a uh, print bed where it creates a part. Common plastics would be ABS, PLA, or nylon, which is the kind of the most common. And these can be hundreds of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars, maybe even more than that. So they really range, and the ones you guys are gonna use are gonna be the lower end, unless you really want to use a higher end version. It'd be nice to, to, to see if we could build this with the lower end 3D printers, but keep that in mind. There's some nice ones both in the Ford building, but also in the Dude. We have some characteristics, which I'm going to summarize or, uh, summarize later, but we have some characteristics for our FDM printers, mostly like layer thickness, build volume, materials, and whether they can do composites. These are the different materials that I thought you guys would need to know. You guys will do ABS or PLA, generally. And then what we have set up already is PLA. But this is a kind of a nice, helpful way of choosing different materials. We talked about stereolithography. Um, this uses a laser and a photoactive resin to build the parts. It's actually really, really neat. Um, form Labs is a is a common SLA 3D printer manufacturer. There's some Form Lab printers in the Ford building. <clears throat> it builds up support like a lattice, and you just break it off, and these the part descends rather than it descends. Um, the ones we have. I think Form Labs uses DLP, so rather than using a laser to heat up the photoactive resin and cure it, it uses an image, and that image comes from a DLP projector. Yeah. You said that um, it this type doesn't use like infill. What does it do instead? What you just, it's solid. It's just an option though to have it like not be completely solid, or I don't know. Not that I've seen, but you might. Is there a is there a way to do an infill on a SLA? Yeah, but you can make it hollow or some percentage of infill, but it's mostly just solid. Yeah, I've only seen it, people who do it as solid because there's no, it's not super heavy. It's the same amount of time, so there's kind of like not as much of an a incentive to create a separate infill section. So with an image, you're burning the entire layer at once. So that's the DLP version. So they're, it's, a, it's a really nice style of printing. The other one I wanted to tell you guys about was PolyJet, which are going to be FDM's the kind of most common, then SLA, then PolyJet. PolyJet printers are sort of like an inch inkjet printer. It sprays the, the a photoactive resin out of a set of jets or nozzles, and then it cures it with a light, the UV light. What's really cool about it is that it does multiple durometers, so it can do rubbery-like parts, and it can do parts with with uh, really really thin layer height. And this was developed by a company called Stratasys. This is the one, I've used this one a couple. The two other institutions I worked with both had this printer. So, but the really big down part is they're UV sensitive and brittle. So over time, these parts will get more brittle and more brittle. And then another thing, does anybody use these at all? Another thing that I've noticed that's really, that I really don't like about them is it's hard to get the support material. <coughs> it's hard to get the support material off. It's like a wax. So the parts always come out feeling kind of waxy, which I don't like either. 
But the best part about this is they do this multi-material concept of rubberiness. They can do color too. Okay, this is a like summary they created. So this describes the two main, or three main printer options, FDM, SLA, and Polyjet, their kind of characteristics, and then I should show two kind of high resolution images of FDM versus PLA. And so this you can kind of see, you can see the striations from the layers, and then SLA, it looks very clean. Cool. So this would be a good slide to like review if you were making a decision about what method to use. Okay, now I want to tell you about where you're going to print. So this just, like I just received this information yesterday. So they're, we're kind of getting everything up online in the Ford building in terms of the makerspace. So this is an option that you guys have. It's not the only option, but this is an option. Okay, where to 3D print? Printers are located in the FRB makerspace, 1141 FRB. There's three Creal Creality Fender 3s. That's these three guys here. So they are there, uh, available for you at all times. We keep them stocked with PLA. It's free. So you guys can use these. You can use them for this class, but also use them for other stuff. The layer thickness is going to be about 0.1 millimeters. The print size is 220 by 220 by 250 millimeters. So that's your volume. You make something bigger than that, it's not going to print that printer. Um, You'll have to use slicing software. Just Cura. And we'll save G code to an SD card that you then insert into printer. Everybody have their laptops? Okay, everybody go to Canvas. Go to Canvas, go to Files. Do you see something under files that says instructions for programming machines? Okay. So oh, go in that folder. You should see 3D printing, water jet, laser cutter. Those inside those folders are the SOPs, the standard operating procedures for those machines. If you want to print something or cut something, that's your first thing you read. So that's going to tell you step by step. It's actually exceptionally well done. Um, I'm pretty sure they, they do multiple layers of detail. So there's like, first there's like a low detail explanation, then a medium detail explanation, then a high detail explanation, or something like that. It's really, really well done. So we have those for all the machines you're gonna use. That's kind of step one. It's gonna tell you some of the stuff that I'm telling you in class, but I kind of put some of the important stuff into that. So you would use Cura, it's gonna tell you to use Cura, unless your, your SDL, and then you would put it on an SD card, you would insert that SD card into this 3D printer, and it kind of talks you through that process, and you would hit print. So where do you guys find instructions about how to make stuff? In Canvas, the files, and the SOPs. I also put them under lab four uh, for, the, for the FDM, I think. Okay, so this is where your 3D printers are. Like, I, wanna, like, I think we should start with these. Let's try to see if these make the parts well enough. If these make the parts not well enough, then we can, we can upgrade. Okay, general best practices. So now you learned about 3D printing types, out of, yeah, out of manufacturing printer types. We're talking about where they are, and we're talking about best practices. So like, how might you change what you're doing if you know you're gonna 3D print something? So these are general best practices. When you're creating your design, you want to minimize volume of support structure so you can when you're considering your design consider how it's going to be manufactured you might want to 
change the way it's designed or laid out such that you can make it easier on the printer. Minimize volume of support structures. And then check that support can be easily separated. So you're going to have to get this support material out. So you want to be conscious of where it's going to be in the design. And tolerancing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Before slicing. So tolerancing, in general, is this idea of like big fits that you want. But in a 3D printer, it's got this extra issue of having some errors as this prints. So we're going to do another layer of tolerancing to, to watch out for that and to kind of account for it. We'll talk about that in a second. So we're going to add tolerancing before slicing. Minimize overall print time. Maximize stiffness. And minimize, I'll just say maximize stiffness. So that might mean minimizing print time. What might go into that? What are some ways you can think that might be easy ways to minimize print time? Infill percentage. Infill percentage. I will seriously modify print time. Also, like how the part is laid out on the bed. That will change print time. That will change support structure use. So like those are things that you, you want to watch out for. You want to keep it low and uh, try to make it use as little support as possible. OK, slicing considerations. 3D printers create parts that are inherently Isotropic or anisotropic. What's anisotropic mean? Talk about it last time. Strong only in one direction. Yeah, our properties are different depending on the direction. So these are going to be stronger in this direction. XY, which we'll say is the print bed. <clears throat> it's going to be weaker in Z directions. You also want to orient the part such, such that printing maximizes strength in desired directions. So these are two little, little schematics saying that like, it's much easier to separate layers like this than like that. And then here's an example of a part that's super already seeing some XY uh, layer separation there. Infill considerations. Always use an infill percentage less than 60 percent. Okay, so there's some, some general best practices. Tolerancing. So this is that idea. This is kind of more, this is general tolerancing, more we were talking about last time. Tolerancing can be broken up into whether you're, is it something is moving or not moving, static assembly versus dynamic assembly. Transition fits are where there's potential for the parts to overlap. Interference fits means the parts will likely overlap. And then clearance means that the tolerancing zones do not overlap. So there will be space between the parts. And what we're doing for 3D printing is really a modified version of this. So we, I told you that we use fits that are called running fits, um, or sliding fits, so we're like in this clearance world, running is tighter than sliding. We, are, we live kind of right here in my research group. From 3D printing, you're gonna live like way over here. So you're gonna have to manually go in and add or change dimensions. So if you have a, a, a pin in a, in a hole, you may need to add 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters for the diameter of those parts. How would you know kind of exactly, or like, what what would change that number, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3? Yeah. If you test it and it doesn't work. That's definitely true. If you test it and it doesn't work, you would definitely modify. But that number is going to be dependent on how large the di how large the part is. So the larger the parts are, the larger space there might need to be. 
until you test it and kind of know exactly dial it in. But you might need to add this. So if you try to assemble something and it won't spin, you can add something like this to your pre-slicing STL file, or you can just sand it. That works really well too. Yeah. Um, if we make a hole too small, do we get to use a drill or something to just expand it? Yeah, you can use a drill or sandpaper to expand it. It is possible that that ends up destroying the part, in which case you, re you just have to reprint it. But that's you can definitely give that a go. That is an option. You can ream holes or drill them out if they're a little bit. Like holes for an FDM will be unresist. So like you may need to add 0 0.1 millimeters for clearance holes. And what happens is the layers compress to make holes smaller than FDM printing. So holes are always undersized. Why else might they be undersized in addition to the layers compressing? Any, tell me how to do with an STL. Any idea? Yeah. So we're using what you're trying, or what you're trying to make it, so it might not perfectly create the shape. Yeah, we're taking a, a circle. We're fitting it with polygons, so we're fitting like straight lines to curved lines, and that will the way that's done has to make the diameter smaller. And then they also it also gets smaller because the layers kind of s s compress and squish a little bit of the of the material out. Okay. So this is to tell you, you might have to go in and modify your holes or your shafts differently than you would for normal machining, normal traditional machining processes. So you have to go in and add extra space. Okay. This is real important. This is another thing, and we have a demo for this. There are lots of ways to add fasteners into 3D printed prototypes. Some of these are better than others. This is the best. This is a heated threaded insert, so it's usually brass or some, some like softer metal. Heat it with a soldering iron and insert it into a specked hole. It melts the plastic, and the plastic kind of uh, engages this threaded insert, which has some knurling on it, and holds it in there, and it makes an awesome way to attach. It can hold, hold lots of force. The threads are very clean. We're gonna, we're gonna actually do this at the end of the slide. We're gonna, we're gonna break. We're going to come up, we're going to demo that up here. So these are awesome. Use them when you can. They're cheap and effective. This is another common way, and what we did on most of our ball bots, is for you can, if you know you're going to capture a fastener, you're going to capture a nut, you can just design something that captures that nut into the prototype. So like you can just, <clears throat> with the measurements or drawings of those nuts, you can space them out a little bit and create a place for that nut to drop in, and then it's held. So we all, most of our, our uh, nuts are captured this way. This keeps you from having to use a wrench or something. That's, that's nice. That's, you, you appreciate that when you're disassembling. This is another like pretty good way. This is a self-tapping screw. So a self-tapping screw has these sharp, something like a wood screw, has these sharp threads. It's going to bite into the plastic. And it's going to hold really well. It's going to be more challenging to, to take on and off. So it's going to be harder to uninstall and reinstall. And if you reinstall it a bunch of times, eventually you're going to cut up the sharp threads and cut that material up. So this is great if you don't have to assemble and disassemble much. All of these, like let's say you, you have a fastener here, and you want to know how big should that hole be. If you find that fastener, something like McMaster Car would have a little drawing for you. Or you could just measure it. But you can get all, that, all the information for this you can get online. Fastener information is very easily found. And then this is kind of the last one. You can just use a machine screw. Um, SolidWorks has like a hole wizard that helps you put sizing for different fasteners, even pre the sizing for, for pre-tapping it or the sizing for a clearance hole. So one idea is to just have this hole be the size of a tap and just let that machine screw tap it. That, does, that works, but it doesn't work well because those threads are too thin. So don't, I would say avoid that unless you don't plan to you know, it's just something quick and dirty. Um, other, some, some printers with higher resolution can actually print the threads. So SLA, for example. But in my experience, that doesn't work too well. So I, I think I would recommend sticking with one of these two methods. How many people have done this before? Nice. OK. So what we're going to do is have everybody come up here. 
really, we have some that we're going to do, and then you guys are going to do. We're all going to create these real fast. Um, so can you guys, everybody, come up and kind of cluster around right here? We're going to do this here. Pass nothing around. Okay, so like your fence is on that side. What sizes do we have here? This is M4, right? Yep. Yeah. So this is the motor mount. Pass that around. So take a look at the threaded insert. The way it works is you put a, a spec hole. So that hole has a diameter that's required. We have to know that. We can let you know what, what size that is. It'll say kind of on the packaging, I think. And then so there's a spec hole. We have our threaded insert and a soldering iron. We're just going to put this in the hole, put the soldering iron on it. It's going to heat up if you think about two minutes. And then you're going to feel it. If you give it gentle pressure, it's going to just squeeze right down in there. And then it's done. And you pull the soldering, out, soldering iron out and let it cool. Um, we've done a couple of these. So you can look at some of these that are already done. You can feel them. Um, and then we're going to do these. So can you guys, I'll do this one. So we do a hot soldering iron. It's set at 670. This, this insert has kind of a fat end and a kind of a narrower end. The narrower end is going to go in, and it's just sitting in that hole right now. So if I just do this, the things I'm like paying attention to now is not pressing on too hard, just enough to give it contact, and keeping it straight. Once it get, once it melts, it's going to be soft, and I can if I can I can put it at an angle, which would be bad. Can you see it like starting to? Lower. Um, that's just the weight of my hand. So if I give it a little push, So I'm, I think the, uh, I felt like the tip was, yeah, the tip was kind of going through into the silicone. So I put it up on this edge a tiny bit just to give it a little more depth and then kind of like make it flush. But that's it. So if you touch it now, it'll be hot. But that's all it is. It's done. When it cools, it's good. What I kind of want you guys to do is to give it a go. So this one maybe we'll pass around, and the other one, we have a bunch more. Who wants to do one? Yeah, let's do it. Come on up. Start on it. <laughs> so this one we'll pass around. You guys can look at it. Like, take a look. <coughs> And then this one you can do. So, that guy, soldering iron. This one's a little harder, that hole, because it has it's inside the O. Okay. So it has like a little bit more of a... Um, I'll probably avoid the O. Then. Yeah, then you should sure do one of those. Okay. Is there already a hole there? There's already a hole. There's Is that so you're supposed to start like that? Like with a hole there as opposed to just being like kind of just straight plastic? It has to have a hole. Yeah, you drop it into a hole. A, a hole that's the right that's sized for that. Uh, yeah. It takes some time, so it, you got to give it a, a minute to warm it up. Hey, Elliot, when you are putting in a, a threaded insert into a hole, would you rather be uh, more careful to make the hole too big or more careful to make the hole too small? The hole that's being threaded into the thing? Yeah. Which is doing the threaded insert. 
I mean, I would if it had to go one way or the other, I'd probably make it too small and drill it out. Yeah. Speaking of drills, do we have those at the maker space? Yes. And are we allowed to use them? Yeah. Any questions about like tools in makerspace? I would say send to Alyssa, and then if that, if that isn't addressed quickly, then let me know. But yeah, makerspace is run by Alyssa, and it should have tools that you guys are allowed to use. That should be good. So I think you might be pressing it into the. Did you feel like it sunk in there? And it, um, let me see. Yeah, so that's still too high. Okay. So you want to. What I think is happening there is like your the, your tip is going into that, so lift it so your tip like right. set it like that. Gotcha. So your tip has a little more space. Gotcha. Gotcha. It might take a second to keep back up. So where would these go on yours? Where would you put these? Motor mounts. So yeah, I think all of these. I think you will be happy if you put these in your motor mounts as opposed to doing this. We're trying to do a nut and a bolt. One of the great things about anything that you capture as a nut is that you don't have to use a wrench. Otherwise, it's always kind of annoying because you have to have two pieces of, of, of tooling to apply to works. Nice, that looks great. Thanks. <laughs> You're a pro. All right, who's next? So while you guys are doing this, I want to give you another demo. You guys all got to do this, or at least lots of you. The other demo has, was one that I meant to bring uh, when we were talking about transmissions, but I lost these motors, but then I just found them. So, remember we were talking about reflected inertia? What was the deal with reflected inertia? And what would it be if, it were, if we were talking about the inertia of the motor on the output, so the other way around? Multiplied, Multiplied by n squared. So what I have here are two identical motors. One of them has a 9 to 1, 9.6 to 1 transmission on it. One of them has nothing. One of them is direct drive. They have a little bit of different uh, gear sizes, but ignore that. What I want you to do is spin one and just kind of feel the inertia. Feel how light it feels. How light, when you spin it, how light the rotational effort uh, is felt on your fingertips. Now spin the 9.6 to 1. So it's going to make that inertia feel how many, how many times more? Hundred, it's got hundred times more inertia. So my guess is what you'll be able to feel is that you'll be able to feel that it's something like a hundred times different. It's not ten times different. So just kind of interact with these and pass them around. If you guys are done, you can send it back to me. So this just gives us something else to do while we're doing this. Nice. It's looking good. Yeah, looks great. Somebody else. We want to fill all these holes. I wouldn't. <laughs> it just makes your life harder for assembly and disassembly. But that's not that big of a deal. I was thinking we should like three get like a three D model of like a ferret and then screw it to the top so we can put the harness on. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, harness and have a Solder irons. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks great. Perfect. You did this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks great. Who's next? Someone from the right side of it. That's <laughs> the you said you've done it already, right? Yeah. It would be better if somebody you hadn't done it already. <laughs> Thank you for being willing to do it. And if you feel like you want to refresh it, you can definitely do it. <laughs> What 
What happens if you don't get it in straight? What's what is like the likelihood of a what scenario is more likely? If you put it in at an angle, and then you try to assemble it. The screw won't go in, or worse, worst case, you would cross thread it. There's no cross threading. Who knows? Who doesn't know cross threading? Cross threading is where you would put something in, a fastener in, at a slight angle, and it actually captures the next thread instead of the top thread. And so then it's going in, instead of going in straight, something like this, it goes in like this. And it goes in for like a half a turn, a three quarter of a turn, and then it feels like it ran into something, running into the wall. But a lot of times, if you're not experienced or you're, you're doing this through a tool that's giving you a lot of extra torque, you won't realize that it's incanted and it'll just pull the threads out of the nut. And then it's a big problem. So then you're either like replacing this, throwing the part away, or in the case of metal parts, you use something called a heel coil, which kind of gives it a new set of threads, but it's sort of a nightmare. But once you cross the threads, it gets, it gets a lot harder to fix it. So it's nice to keep every, everything in flat. And if you always start a fastener by threading with your hands, you'll never cross thread it. It's only when you're, you're only going to cross it with a tool. So I always start threads with my hands as a result. Cool. Other people? We should fill all these things. And where are the motors at right now? Oh, Can you hot. feel them? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hot. <laughs> Um, can you feel the 100x difference in inertia? Do you feel like does that feel like that was is that like helpful for understanding reflected inertia? Okay, good. Now we're reflecting it on the output there, so we're getting the, the, the n squared increase. It would be like 100 times, maybe I don't know. Because the gears are a different diameter, like that's that's like adding another little transmission ratio at the end. So ideally, I would have the gears be exactly the same size. <laughs> okay, I have an idea. Let's try to rip one of these out. I'm going to try to read this one out. So this one is not in an O, so it's just the regular one. It's really in there. So anybody else want to try to rip it out? Try to rip it out. It's really strong. That's great. Like just like pull it? Yeah, any way to get that thing out of there. What? Yeah, trade me. Try to rip these ones out. <laughs> I know um, can just really they're switching. Yeah. <laughs> so what that shows me is that like it, this is re it's really really strong. I could not I could not rip that thing out. That's great. That's exactly hot head. <laughs> That's great. How how easy and effective that is. Okay. And like, who, who else? We're going to terminate this example in a second. So anybody, anybody else want to, before we shut this down, anybody else want to do this? It's less fun. Do it, I guess. Okay, yeah, do it. <laughs> Simple and effective. The best. That's the answer. And they all have these, correct? They all have like, yeah, yeah we put yeah, the M4. Sweet. So we have these for you guys if you want to use them. So what this might look like uh, for your for your motor mounts, for instance, like you got holes for your motor mounts. But there's going to be uh, a size of like this M4 threaded insert, which may or may not be different than the holes of your motor mounts. So like when you guys are making your parts working on SOLIDWORKS, the thing we check is, okay, well, how big is this threaded insert hole, and does that match up with my motor mount? Um, so I think that's a thing that you guys are in lab work, you're at home working, to consider to make sure that you can, if you want to, use these threaded inserts as opposed to something else. Um, 
And I think I like a really good point that these four ways that he showed you, you can all of these will work, but like work to different levels uh, of uh, of effectiveness. And so, you know, at first you might be really excited because you're gonna build your ball bot, that's gonna be awesome. And you're like, I'm just gonna use machine screws. But you know, three weeks from now, when you've had to uh, you know, take the screws out and put them back in 40 times, and now things are like really loose, that's when I think these started inserts or even using the hex up that they can be really useful. So mm -hmm. I think a good thing to think about when you guys are designing cards is like think about your future self. And you're like, oh yeah, like, I got this homework assignment. I have plenty of time to do it. And then you're like the day before, you're like, it's three in the morning. Why am I doing this homework assignment? You're like, wow, I really wish past me would have taken care of future me. I think these are a great example of like using these hex nuts or threaded inserts, to like use past you to take care of future you to make your life much easier. Why do you have to take the fire? I think so. So, something where there's a bunch of reasons something breaks, uh, maybe the part is not too thin, maybe uh, you realize, oh, I have to pull in the wrong place. Um, sometimes it's like, oh, I have to take the motor out, and so you're going to realize maybe it's just easier to take this entire motor out or like take the entire oh. motor out off. There are a billion things that could go wrong. Uh, you all will experience that. Uh, so enjoy, but yeah, I think Elliot's making maybe, really good points about this. Maybe we should use those. <laughs> Not yeah. 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 It's five point eight four. Five point eight four millimeters. Yeah. Okay, so that was the size, and it says that probably in the packaging. Yeah. Okay. So the hole for this is this one is five point eight four millimeters. It's a five point eight four through hole with a one mm chamfer, so that the threaded insert can sit on top of the hole. Other chamfer. One mm chamfer, forty five degrees. You guys know what a chamfer is? There's like the hole inside the hole, right? A chamfer is, a, is taking a corner and flattening it. So it has like a flattened section. So that makes it kind of like almost be like a funnel to center this threaded insert. And then it also has a lip at the top that sits in that. Okay. All right. We'll stick or we'll have, we still have one more slot left, but we'll do that. Uh, if anybody wants to come up after class and do it. So for now, we'll continue with lecture. I do want to give you guys a quiz. Yeah, it's fine. I like it. It's fine. Right. time. Cool, huh? Yeah. Easy. So incredibly easy. Just a bunch of like the metal. Don't have to do this. Where the metal can't melt the plastic. Yeah. I don't know if that's what you just said. No, that's what we were just asking. Yeah, no, I was just listening to your head. That's what I was talking about. So I think that hopefully is helpful for you guys building machines. Now you can sort out many different ways to do fasteners, and then some of them are real easy. Another thing that I want to mention, another sort of like best practice thing, is a lot of times you might be trying to build a robot, and you want a solid model to, to help you with the building of that robot. Maybe a solid model that's like something from society, not necessarily a machine you're building. <laughs> So many times you might want to make something that requires the solid model of something common. Like an iPhone, you make an iPhone case. Or maybe you want to make like something that mounts to the body. You might need like a body part, like a leg or an arm or something. Um, these types of solid models can be downloaded from repositories that are really, really awesome. The best, or what I like the most, is GravCAD. Another one is Thingiverse. Um, GrabCAD has like over 1.3 million solid models, from all sorts of types of solid models. Um, people create them and upload them, and you can create an account, download them, and use them. Same thing with Thingiverse. Thingiverse, I think, is more commercial products, and GrabCAD is more like a user community, but I could be wrong about that. But I use GrabCAD a lot. So it's an online. 
repository of 1.3 million solid models. And it'll tell you like what kinds of solid models it has, whether it's a step file or a solid part or an IGIS, yeah. What kind of things have you used off of GraphCare? For example, like human body parts. Yeah, downloaded like legs, feet from it. I've downloaded like a cars off of it, full car, full scale cars. <laughs> I mean, you can download anything. I mean, there's tons and tons of solid models and they'll be in all different types of formats, yeah. What's that word in the, after something? Common. What I was trying to do here, I tried to do this last week. I was trying to, what I wanted this to do is, I was gonna download a, I download a solid model from GrabCat and I was gonna try to insert a 3D PDF right here, which would let me like spin the file. But I couldn't figure out how to, how to get the uh, PDF to insert into the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> but I can show you, if you guys want, I can show you a 3D PDF um, that will, maybe I'll do that next time, but it's just a way, it's like an STL file, like a way to share solid model information. But you can share it in a PDF, which is cool. So that's what I was trying to do there. I downloaded a really cool race car to show you. So these are just, these are all different repositories. And I like GraphCAD. But it's a kind of a really big thing is just having these repositories of solid models. So with your 3D and pretty instructions, you download and print them. Anything. The thing thing versus is all STL files. Okay, so this kind of brings us to the end of additive manufacturing. What we're gonna do now is talk about some subtractive manufacturing. We're gonna start on laser cutters, talk through a little bit about them, and then we're gonna do this quiz. And the quiz is from last lecture that we didn't get to. Any questions about additive manufacturing before we move to subtractive? How do you feel right now? Like, how would you say you feel? Like, what's your comfort level with additive manufacturing from this class? Like, how, how do you feel comfortable with it? Yes. Did you feel comfortable with it before this class? So, how many? How many would say this class helped them feel comfortable? These lectures. All right, that's pretty good. I'll take it. I'm just trying to gather like. When we're creating these lectures, it's a little bit unclear, like how much depth to put. We kind of have a long way to go, but I appreciate that feedback. And I think I, I'm, I'm happy with the way we're going through the material, so you guys know I feel good about it. Okay, subtractive manufacturing. 3D printing, probably your best tool for rapid prototyping. Um, well, no, let me, let me like say it is a amazing tool, but we're about to learn also some amazing tools laser cutters and water jets. We mostly focus on the laser cutter because that's what you're gonna use in this class. But a water jet is probably, if someone asks me what's my favorite rapid prototyping tool, it'd be a water jet. Okay, so we're gonna learn some subtractive methods that are quick and easy. Subtractive manufacturing is gonna be CNC machining. We're not gonna talk about, it's laser cutting and water jetting. And they are really awesome tools for prototype generation with a little bit of clever design. Goes a long way. Look at these parts. These are like laser cut wooden parts. There's lots of examples of topological maps, topographical maps cut with laser cutters. So let's look at this. So that's very straightforward to create some really cool looking maps. I've seen people do like resin tables that have like water, like resin, and really beautiful looking landscapes. These are cool, cool furniture cut with laser cut wood. And these are two little robot examples. There's tons of laser cut options for like building small prototyping robots. The robot arm is a little vehicle. But all of those materials that you're seeing are all cut with a laser cutter. So if you can start to think about like how to design things out of 2D shapes, then a whole world of like making really awesome and sophisticated prototypes opens up, but you have to be able to think about making everything in terms of a 2D shape. 
How do laser cutters work? A laser cutter focuses a laser onto the surface of a part. So we have some sort of laser generator. We're going to talk mostly about CO2 lasers. It emits a laser, which is then refracted off, or reflected off of a mirror, focused through the lens, and then um, goes through this head to the part. This is the, what they call a workpiece of the part, through a nozzle, where, where gas is kind of put around the laser as it goes through. And it cuts the part through uh, and kind of creates some width. So it can cut detailed parts and raster images. More about that later. It has a protective gas layer. And when it cuts, when the laser is cutting into the material, it has some width. So the cut has some width. This width is known as kerf. That's this. So kerf is the material removed by the laser. There are three types of laser cutters. CO2 lasers. This is a tube. A tube containing gases produce a laser That is focused on the part. So I mean, somewhere inside that CO2 laser cutter is a giant tube filled with specialized gas. That gas is electrified, creates a laser, comes out the one end. One of the ends has a has a uh, cover that allows the, the laser to pass through. It goes. That's a laser generator. Kind of passes passes off a mirror and is used to cut the part. Another type of laser cutter is fiber lasers. So these are solid state. All I know is, I don't know much about these. I don't, I don't know that I've ever used one. Um, it's 100 times more powerful than CO2. Versatile, like I think a, a fiber laser is a really versatile type of laser cutter. It's extremely expensive. I don't know that we have any here. Yeah. What's, what do you mean by solid state laser? What does that mean? That I, I have to look up. I'm not sure other than, I don't, maybe it doesn't have a, a gas tube. Okay. It generates a laser in a different way, but I don't know enough about laser physics to know like what okay. it is, the solid state is creating. But it doesn't have a laser tube. Okay. And I don't know, I mean, I don't really know how common these are. I only, these are everywhere. These are like in every makerspace or prototype shop in the country. These, I'm not so sure. Do you guys, either, so there, have you guys seen these fiber lasers or these? I don't even know how to say these other ones. Online it says it costs from 225000 to 250000 Which one? Fiber lasers? Yeah. Yeah, sounds about right. We were just talking about that the, the, the makerspace has a metal laser cutter and then it also has an acrylic laser cutter, which you guys use the oh, acrylic one. It does have a metal. It, it yeah. might be a fiber laser. That's that's what we were thinking about. It's either it uses like nitrogen or it's a fiber laser. That's actually what we use to cut the M blue parts. Right. So like, okay, yeah, we'll find out. We'll find out more information on that. I don't know that you guys will use it for this class, but whatever that is, it's probably awesome, and we should use it. You should know about it as a resource. So I'll find out, and we'll figure. We'll like let you guys know. This is an extremely powerful laser. It's a narrow focal length. And it cuts metals, or it cuts many materials, including metals and some ceramics. We are going to focus on this. Talk a little bit more about kerf. So kerf is going to come up uh, when you're making your parts. 
you'll have to account for that, or you may have to account for this, otherwise your holes are gonna be the wrong size. So kerf is typically, <coughs> so typically like 0 0.08 or 0.45 millimeters on, on the CO2 laser. It depends on laser optics, material type, thickness, consequences. So the fact that we're cutting some material out in a laser cutter, this curved part, consequences is parts are undersized. Holes holes will be oversized. So there is it is some laser fetters do can like offset based on the, this concept of curve. So they'll change the tool path to account for that and give you a different shape. To my knowledge, the, the CO2 laser that we have doesn't do this. So tool paths can be offset to account for a curve. So a universal CO2 laser does not compensate. To my knowledge. If anybody, if anybody hears otherwise, let me know. But to my knowledge, I, the universal doesn't do this. So you might need to modify the parts. or .dxf files to accommodate curve. So it's similar to the kind of, to the tolerancing you might need to do for additive manufacturing. You have to account for the fact that they have to change tolerances to make things move with respect to each other. A similar concept is true for laser cutter. You gotta account for this curve concept. If you care about your part dimensions within kind of that tolerance. We're going to cut acrylic. There's a little bit to know about acrylic. I won't tell you about it. So our laser cutter cuts acrylic, also known as, anybody know the other names for acrylic? There's a bunch of names. Plexiglass, Lucite, Perspex, Polycarbonate, is that, is that acrylic? No, it's not acrylic, I'll come back to that. Okay, manufacturing methods, two types of acrylic, cast and extruded. The reason why this matters is because cast is, is better for laser cutting. The acrylic you guys have is cast. You can also get extruded. This is better for thermoforming. Okay, we're using 3 16 sheets. So when you cut these, you have to know the thickness of that material. It's going to be 3 16. Do not cut. Polycarbonate, or also called Lexan, it absorbs IR radiation. What happens if you cut polycarbonate? We yeah. Refract all around inside the laser and not actually cut through. Kind of like sends the laser back up. I think it melts. I think it melts. I think it melts, and oftentimes it won't cut. Like it'll melt, it'll melt, it'll like warp, deform, and get weird, but it'll melt, it'll close right back up behind it. Okay, other materials that cannot be cut on a laser cutter. PVC, styrofoam, MDF, glass, Metals, 
chlorinated or nitrile rubber. So the list of things you can cut on a laser cutter is not super long. If you cut the wrong materials, it can be very dangerous. A lot of times, for like anything with like PVC, styrofoam, it creates chlorine gas if you use it on a laser cutter, which is deadly. Yeah. What is MDF? MDF? It's yeah. medium density fiberboard. That's like what you would see everything made of. This is MDF. It's like compressed sawdust with glue. It's like what shelving is made from. Looks like wood, but it's not wood. Looks like plywood, but with much smaller particles. So some MDF would actually be okay, but it have to be um, the, the glue used to hold it together has to be laser compatible. So for now, I just say don't, don't use it. Other materials that can be cut with a laser cutter, obviously acrylic, but also paper, or cardstock, hardwood, laser grade plywood, or MDF, leather, so laser cutters cut some materials, and if they if you could work with these materials, then you can develop a lot of really neat prototypes with laser cutters. This is our laser cutter. The universal CO2. Um, 75 watt, which is on like the higher end of the of a CO2 laser spectrum. We already talked about this the instructional standard operating procedures that were uploaded to Canvas, so you have those. Laser cutters can be dangerous. So they, you have to follow, like make sure you read the SOP, follow the safety instructions. You have to turn on the gas, you have to turn on the air, you have to make sure the vents are open. Like So there's some sets that are all kind of discussed in the SOP. You just want to make sure you do that, make sure you do it with, with Alyssa. Yeah. Uh, guys, make sure you guys all did get your laser training when you laser cutter training when uh, like the first lab, right? Yeah. Do you guys feel comfortable using it without without her, without Alyssa with you? No. Okay. Yeah. I think it's okay to have Alyssa be with you. That's probably what I would do. It's good that you've been trained on it, and like I would say, as she works with you, try to learn it so that you could use it without her there. But I'd say if it were me, I would have her there just because of the intensity of laser cutters. Um, okay, there are settings within a laser cutter. We're going to talk about those for a second. Settings, they have a, there's power, which is laser intensity. Speed. Cutting speed, how fast it's traversing. PPI, which is laser pulses. For rastering, and Z axis is always set to zero. So if we look at this, this is the program that you would actually use. You guys probably saw that during your training. The program you actually used to run the laser cutter. Um, and then here are your settings. And then here are different colors that are attached to different settings. This is going to be my last slide. Oh, you're not going to be able to get. The, you're not going to do this quiz. Okay, I want to tell you about vectoring and rastering. Um, these are two different types of graphics. What are vector graphics? Um, what is it? Line art. Where you just have to line the yeah, that sounds right. But with, do you guys know there's something special about what vector graphics are? What they contain? The information they contain? What can you do with vector graphics that are different than normal? Yeah. Don't they just contain equations so you can scale everything perfectly? Right. They, they contain basically like the vectors to where the points are as relationships instead of locational dots of color. So you can scale it and it doesn't lose resolution. So vector graphics can be scaled. Functions. represent the relationships 
three pixels. Raster graphics is the other version. So raster graphics, <coughs> like a bitmap, would be just a set of locations of colors. So these are individual pixels. Not scalable. Okay, so there's two types of graphics, raster graphics and vector graphics. Those are gonna come into play in how the laser cutter interprets these graphics forms. It also uses the color of the line in the DXF to tell the laser like, what to do. Its instructions are the color of the DXF. The line colors that we're gonna worry about are red and black. Vector cutting, which is a, a like cut through your part, is a red line. Vector etching is a black line. Raster etching is a black filled area. I want you to see this set of pictures. Okay, so like cutting, you can see cutting there. Raster etching is just making it so it's dark, but it's not cut out. And then the, raster, the vector etching is dark, but not cut through. This is showing you power and speed. And it's showing you, I think, I'm not sure what laser cutter cut this, but the uh, reason why this is in here is to show you like, the relationships between these. So you can get all sorts of different looks, colors, by the settings of the laser. So these will be really dark, obviously these are really light, but you can change these settings depending on how you want it to look. And I, I suspect there is a, somewhere we have a part for this universal laser cutter that, that shows this for you guys. That's my guess. But this is really a really neat aspect of laser cutting. So you can create graphics. You can create colored graphics because you can change, your colors can be represented by this palette. So it, it, the rastering part's really neat. Other colors are user definable. I don't know if you remember, like when you just looked at the screen for the laser cutter, it had all these different colors that it was defining different settings. Let me show you it's this. So these are the these are the colors, and it's defining the speed and the power and the PBI for those colors. So if you were to open your DXF and change the colors to these colors, it would interpret those colors as this way to cut. But I think all you guys really need to know is red and black, unless you want to, unless you want to like mess with it. This is from uh, a website I found. So this is for our universal CO2 laser. These are a bunch of materials, acrylic, aluminum, cork, glass, leather, marble, mat, mat board, plastics, rubber, blah, blah, blah. And it gives all the settings for those. So you would probably want to confirm this with a test part or something, but this is like should get you pretty close. Did somebody say something? Good question. Okay. Okay. So this gives you like some of the information you need to set up a laser cutter for different materials. We're going to stop here. I'm going to give you this quiz, um, and then we'll continue with this next week. This quiz is kind of just to kind of gauge your your knowledge of how you're tracking what's what. Yeah.